This is the e-commerce brain trust, a podcast about building momentum online for established consumer brands. Join our hosts and their expert guests for high level conversations about e-commerce strategies, trends, and innovations. Access our brain trust and boost your brand's e-commerce potential. Welcome to the e-commerce brain trust podcast. I'm Julie Spear, head of retail marketplace services at Acadia. And today I'm joined by two special guests. The first is Scott Oshman, VP of digital commerce at Quickfire and host of the always off brand podcast. If you haven't given it a listen, I highly, highly recommend that you do. It's very entertaining, great energy and incredible insights on what's happening in our industry. I'm not just saying that because you're here, Scott. Thank you, Julie. (laughs) And rounding out my guest slate today is our very own Ken Beamer, Director of Retail Client Growth at Acadia. I'm excited because in addition to these two just being wonderfully fun, interesting people to talk to, they're also diehard sports fans, which is perfect for today's topic, where we'll be discussing the increasingly dynamic and expansive role that Amazon plays in the world of live sports. So with that, Welcome, Scott and Ken. I'm happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. This first question I'm actually going to send your way, Scott. And it involves kind of a very specific hypothetical scenario. Let's say you have someone on your team that's sharing their screen for an important call. And instead of sharing a deck, they accidentally share their fantasy football chat group. (laughs) Is that a forgivable offense? What's your response in that moment? Purely hypothetical. <laughs> yeah. Wow, Julie. It sounds hypothetical. No one ever has had this happen to anyone, not you, Julie. That could be dire, actually, depending how long that's up and depending how distracted the viewers are. That could cause problems. As we record this, a lot of drafts for the NFL season are coming up, and I highly recommend don't do that. Make sure that tab is not able to be viewed by anything. This is high stakes, especially if you're any type of money exchange, Julie. This is a serious time for a big time degenerate sports fan like myself when we have two, three, or maybe more NFL drafts coming up. (laughs) Julie, I know this is audio only, so no one can see my big grin on my face because this is not a hypothetical situation that I unfortunately found myself in three years ago and that Julie has not let me live that down. So this is a note, like if you don't get anything from the podcast, just when you share your screen, make sure you click the right tab that you're trying to share. But look at um, you, Julie, (laughs) well played right out of the gun, right out of the gate. Bam. I, you know, it's a sports focused podcast, sports focused episode. I think a little good natured ribbing out of the gate. You got to talk smack, Julie. Smack talk is part of it. (laughs) I do enjoy some good smack talk. (laughs) And Ken, you are one of the most good natured people I know. I appreciate you coming along for it. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be the punching bag today. But yeah, I'm excited to walk past that little jab and get into the meat of here. (laughs) All right. So I'm moving right along then. Now, I am not necessarily a sports aficionado. There are moments that I'll get into, like March Madness. I really support my college team during March Madness. Love those really pivotal games, but really I'm in it for the wings and the entertainment value of like halftime shows. I am not necessarily the aficionado, which is why Ken is here. Can you both explain to me kind of what sports distribution and broadcasting looked like for standard sports fan before Amazon and other tech players became involved in the space? Basically, right, we've been built on just similar to a lot of brands and manufacturers we all deal with, right? There's the distribution models. What happens is the leagues, and for anybody who's not a sports fan, and I talk about all this time, when we talk about these rights, so media right deals for these properties, which is NFL league, these leagues, sports leagues, professional sports league, You talk about the NFL, NFL is on a completely different hemisphere. There's no dollars, no demand, no consumer, no fan. The NFL is on a whole different level when I talk about this. Let's just keep that in mind. But how it was done was major networks, legacy broadcast networks, NBC, CBS, Fox came in about 25, 30 years ago, maybe more. And what they do, we had cable. So cable is the distribution model. 
And basically, the consumer would pay the cable these fees. So it could be $2 a month, $3 a month. And these are monthly costs. And these are the distributors. So the networks would pay huge amounts for these NFL, NBA, MLB, these property rights. Okay. They would not only get advertisers, but they get massive revenue from these cable operators. So really, before tech got involved, live sports was really kind of closed off market. And they'd sign these long deals, 10-year deals, seven years, very long because the way the model was, the distribution model, right? It was like you only had one place to go. And it was these cable operators and these big networks. The competition, there wasn't. There was three networks. That was it. And then ESPN. I should call that ESPN. ESPN still makes $70 million a month just solely on cable operation payments. That's how it works. And for all of us, if you watch NBA or Major League Baseball, we'll get into this. But the only other layer here is regional sports networks, which had the same things. They would buy rights and then they would get money off the cable operators. And then you and I and Ken and I, because we're sick sports fans, we have no rhyme or reason or rationalization to how much we spend. We would continue, hey, if it's $5 more a month on your cable package. Okay. I'm the guy who had to have the Big Ten network because I grew up in Iowa. So I pay more. That's how legacy traditional live sports and it was delivered to the consumer before tech got involved. Ken, do you have anything to add? Something I missed? Well, yeah, no, I was just thinking, I feel like Amazon, Hulu, we're talking about Netflix for a long time has said that they didn't want to really get into the live sports arena. Now they've kind of turned on their head on that. You've seen these major tech players have to wait out some of those legacy deals because when they sign those legacy deals, CBS, Fox, those are 10-year, 15-year, 20-year deals. I feel like these tech giants have just kind of been sitting idly by waiting for those to expire. And now what we're going to be talking about today, we're seeing the ramifications of those deals expiring and these tech giants that have the bankroll to now step into that arena. We're starting to see that happen. And a personal anecdote from this, I grew up in Kentucky and Cincinnati Reds, me and my dad would watch those games all the time. So I moved down to Georgia about 10 years ago. And now I use my parents' login on their direct TV to get Reds games because I can get those Reds baseball games if I use my parents' login. I might get in trouble if this if this gets got to get you off the dole, Ken. I have adult children. We've got to get you off. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I feel like we should edit this part out. I don't want to mess with the setup that you have going. I got a red flag, you know. (laughs) My login's not going to work next time, you know. (laughs) But it it struck me because I knew we were going to have this conversation, and it struck me because my son, my eight year old son's getting into baseball now, so we put on the Reds games at night and all these local Cincinnati businesses started to pop up on the advertising during commercial breaks. I was We're going to get that. to that. That's a great yeah. point. I think leading into this, Julie, I think another macro like to set this conversation up. So I've talked about how the major networks and the major rights holders and the major leagues, the regionality, which I kind of talked about these regional sports network, this adds a whole nother layer to what is going on. The last thing I will say to set this up also is that it's a confluence like many developments over, Ken mentioned over 10 years, the confluence of streaming number one, but then scripted television, which costs a lot of money. And when you talk about Amazon, they bought MGM studio for a zillion, I don't remember the number, a lot. So to develop and build these shows, scripted television costs a fortune, okay? What they're all realizing is, Live sports commands the highest revenue, the highest. Re- it's not even close other than the Grammys and a presidential debate and the Olympics. Honestly, it's the top. Uh, you take the top 100 rated television shows in the country of the U.S. 80 percent are either NFL or college football, period, dot, dash, end of story. That's it. Well, <laughs> I'm not watching those top 80 percent. I need to <laughs> I need to get around to it. I mean, just to get a sense, if you're not a sports fan, I talk about this all the time. If you're not into this, like I'm a completely nerd into it, you'd have no idea that the power of live sports and why these guys, if people get shocked at these numbers they put out, and this is why. Well, given that, can you, I mean, and given our, also the other thing that you nerd out over, Scott, that I actually share with you is Amazon. (laughs) 
Can you walk me through the timeline of Amazon's entree into live sports? I mean, there's even their investment here. There's even been developments just in the past few weeks. What is the chronology of their investment in sports, Ben? I did a whole episode on this and always off brand. Humble, humble brag right there, huh? We'll link it in the show notes. Yeah, we'll, no, we no. We will cross promote. <laughs> yeah, no, anyway, I went through this whole chronologically and I don't have it in front of me, so I'm not going to be perfect on my dates. But basically, they bought MGM Studio. They talked about some other things. And then their biggest play, honestly, was Thursday Night Football, which was a tossed around property that the NFL made up out of dust. Fox had it. NBC had it. Nobody wanted it because they already had the Sunday thing and it was just production wise. And so Thursday night football is probably the biggest known entry for the NFL into Amazon. And they literally, how they did it is, no one cares about this, but they basically took the Sunday night football production team, even the executive producer, Fred, can't remember his last name now, but anyway, he'd been doing it for years. What they did is the problem with Amazon is they didn't have the production expertise and they didn't have the executive producers. So they basically went and made a deal with NBC. NBC basically produces Thursday Night Football on the back end, Fred Gadilly. Anywho, that's when they really started going in. Then globally, they started playing around and there was an opportunity to get premier soccer, to get football in the Premier League. So they bought some rights in the UK. Then they go around. If you Wikipedia this, you will be stunned at all the different European global live sports leagues they have bought over the last even five years. They get deeper into that. And then they just launched, you alluded to last week, they signed a deal to get the NBA rights, not this coming year, but the year after. And then they've continued to get more and more NFL games. They now have this year, their first playoff game, which is massive. What am I forgetting, Ken? Yeah, there's the recent almost $2 billion investment on the NBA, but that also includes WNBA. They're going into NASCAR. The playoff game, I was just going to say, Julie mentioned at the top, like pay attention to the big events, those sorts of things. Julie, you might not care about week four of the NFL season, but if your <laughs> Cleveland Browns are in the playoffs, you're paying attention to that. And that audience, that nationwide audience just gets so much larger. And so like Scott was saying, to win the rights of a playoff game, Again, like we were going to talk about the impact of the audience and like why this matters to the folks listening here and like what the data there, but just the fact that they can capture even a bigger audience with a live sport when a playoff game and now they're differentiating on all these different sports. It's opening up such a wide variety of audience because like a typical NASCAR fan or WNBA fan looks different than maybe a typical NFL fan. And again, I think that's Amazon's play here. So they bought the rights in 2017. What has happened? It's so smart on both levels. The NFL has a demographic issue. They need to appeal to a younger generation. And a lot of this is family, right? Brings on family. But what happened with the Thursday night football for Amazon came on and the numbers weren't phenomenal because they get the crappiest games, to be honest, and they're getting better games. But what happened was, and this is what's important if you're an Amazon brand and you're listening to this, you're a Katie or whoever. They did better between 18 and 34 than any of their traditional legacy media partners had ever done. And that's what they love. They didn't care. They only got a 10 million views or their viewership was about 10 to million, 11 million, which is a little bit down than traditional. But the thing they loved about and the thing they're gaming and they're getting big advertising is they're reaching that 18 to 35 way better than any of their traditional partners. And also, Sky, I was just going to say, last year, I don't know if you caught, they did a partnership with Dude Perfect, if you're familiar with those folks. Yeah. So again, I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. They're in the Dude Perfect world. For those not familiar, they're a huge YouTube streaming personality group. You're talking about 18 to 35-year-old. This is probably the five to 15-year-old demographic. And so last year, they did a Thursday night football game with the Dude Perfect guys there. My kids do not sit there for three hours and watch an NFL game, but they did that night. And maybe it's the world that we live in and folks listening here in the e-commerce world. My first thought was like, oh, this is a cool collaboration. My second immediate thought was like, I wonder if I'm going to start getting some advertising for like Nerf guns and things like that, the more targeted audience here. But that collaboration too, like just getting that younger demographic hooked worked in my house. But this is why, Julie, Amazon Sports, which isn't an official brand 
or title. They actually came out. I learned about this. They tried to do sports talk radio and it just didn't work. It's like the fire phone. I don't know. They canned it, but this is leading into the next phase of why Amazon sports to me is a sleeping giant. And it's part of the new flywheel, which is content, advertising, and logistics. Well, that kind of leads into my next question, Scott, was how is Amazon's investment in live sports different from the other streaming and tech giants? With You got Paramount Plus, Hulu, HBO Max, they've gone one way. How is Amazon differentiating from them and their investment in sports over the past few years? Because they don't sell anything. I just laid that for you. Thank you very much. I mean, you teed that up brilliantly. (laughs) And that's what the flywheel, the old Amazon flywheel, that is the vortex. Prime has always been the vortex to suck you into everything. And that's what's so brilliant. And I'd even extend it to my concern, our friends at Walmart, who I'm cheering for and ranting and raving of them to get it going, right? Do they have a content play? No. No, they don't. Amazon brilliantly is like, hey, live sports is a huge, huge market. And that feeds the system. And guess what? We have not only non-endemic, which is a big deal in advertising right now for Amazon, right? Bringing in those in. Oh, my goodness. Think of the audience reach. Think of the ability for manufacturers and brand who sell on Amazon to actually get this audience. The biggest difference is I would contend, and I just you can fact check me, which is facts ruin a good story, as I like to say, Julie. I'll just let you float it out there. Go for it. Other than credit cards and certain government agencies, Amazon has the largest and most complex and intricate first party data of any US company probably in the world, other than maybe China. I don't know. <laughs> it's growing. We've seen this as Amazon nerds, lovingly, I call us nerds. They played off that. And live sports is a huge investment because it's going to help them sell more stuff, which is going to sell more logistics, which is going to sell more services. I guess then the next look is the timing of it. Is Does it go to the waiting out of contracts like you talked to, Ken? Amazon had already proven itself in its media services from a content perspective. That's been happening since what? Going back as far as 2011, creating its own original content, going back to 2013. What does it tell us from a timing perspective about Amazon's approach to sports that they're pushing for an investment this significant now? I was just going to say one quick thing on this too. I think one of the plays too is if there's been holdouts on getting an Amazon Prime membership, this is also another foray into who else can we get to sign up for Prime? Again, I reference my parents. My parents live in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. They don't really care about the two-day shipping. Like They've never found the value in it. But you start taking my dad's NFL games away or you start pulling that, that kind of stuff. Again, you're going to get some of these holdouts that you haven't found the need for an Amazon Prime membership or haven't found the value in it. Now you're opening them up to maybe out of necessity, we have to get them. Yeah, I was just going to say in terms of right now, I think, Julie, like we said earlier, the legacy contracts expiring, they've probably been able to prime up their offering here and their strategy over the last few years, getting ready for those events, getting ready for those contracts to expire. That was just the one piece that I was going to add, but yeah, go ahead, Scott. You made a great point because what they also did last year for the first time, Julie, is they, again, just like Prime Day in 2015, poof, magically out of dust, they created Black Friday football. So they added more Prime members reportedly in that day than they had for the previous Prime Day. Same thing. You asked me what the difference between Hulu and Peacock it is. There aren't a lot of differences. And now you see Netflix got in. Now they get a Christmas game. Okay, they've entered into this. If you think about the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, all these sports, they're sitting there going, wait a minute. I talked to NBC. I talked to CBS, the regional sports. By the way, cable, we all know the cut the cord. I just haven't, I'm old and I haven't done it yet. But it's down so dramatic. It was 130 to 150 million households even five years ago. Then COVID accelerated it. It's down to 60 to 70 million and decreasing every single month, every single year is decreasing. The ability to create prime memberships, Peacock had an exclusive game, the NBC streaming. They got more memberships off one exclusive NFL game than they'd had forever. And now the Olympics... Shout out Peacock. I am a huge fan. They got 5 million views on Peacock just on the first day of the Olympics. That's earth shattering. 
Have I answered any of the questions, Julie? God, I'm bad at this. You're tying them all together because I think your answer here goes to the whole flywheel. It's kind of the update of Amazon's flywheel that their play into sports is another like cog. Is cog the right word for yeah, the flywheel? It's a spoke in the wheel. Spoke in the wheel. That's better. <laughs> so I think you're tying a lot of questions together. And I'll move into kind of a new direction because a lot of what we talk about here is what these insights, what changes and updates and the direction that Amazon is going, what it actually means in the day-to-day for brands. What's the reality for brands? And these developments that we're talking about, I think could mean something different depending on the size and the maturity of the brand. I know personally, I've been sitting in on conversations with one of our larger brands as they're negotiating media packages and sponsorships with Amazon Sports Division. It's been an interesting experience to witness for sure. I'm curious about your take on how a large and national brand should be leveraging Amazon's investment into sports to further the brand's strategic goals. Because I've heard anecdotally off-the-cuff statements from some brands that hold one perspective where others see this as the path. This is an awareness play that you must make. What's your take? How do you look at this? Well, I firmly believe, right or wrong, that the play for Amazon, uh, dealing with them for 18 years now, is they want to automate everything, I guess. Okay, They want to make it self-help for all the brands and anybody on their platform, they want to make it self-help. So what this means to me, the brand is, and this is what I say all the time on our show, and Ken, we haven't had a chance to talk about this. What is happening is the new world is they've created ad inventory at a scale that is unheard of. Ken's dad in Kentucky is going to get served if he's watching Cincinnati. Now Amazon has that platform as a brand. I sell and I know demographics, what have you. Kentucky might be the wrong right. I don't know. Used to have a big shoe warehouse there, one of their biggest shoe warehouses, but they have a lot of Amazon warehouses there. Anyway, fulfillment centers, meaning I can basically target Ken's dad on the Amazon platform. They're in 37 regional markets now with this whole spend and buy, which we didn't talk about, of Diamond Sports as a valley, which is going bankrupt. Think of the inventory. So what this means to a brand, whether you're small, big, or little, you have that little click, that little button on your ad console, whether you're a teeny tiny seller, and it says sponsored TV. So in theory, there's no minimum there, Julie. In minimum, I could be on streaming TV. I could be watching Dude Perfect. I could be watching any of the content that they have built up. And I could buy ad space as a very cost-effective thing. On the big brand, it is absolutely brand awareness. We're in the age I tease lovingly my co-host, Summer Jubileer. She's full funnel, Summer Jubileer, never met a marketing expense she didn't love. This is a tremendous opportunity. And all the ad sales people at Amazon are going to be selling hard is because they have these massive media packages. They're buying huge content. The sports is one thing, but they're also doing huge other properties. They are going to be selling this because it's profitable. It's massive wideness. And the biggest key is you can track it. You can't get perfect attribution, but a lot better than legacy media. In the conversations when they're selling it, though, it's limited data that's accompanying the conversation. And you're talking about Amazon as a platform itself, as the way most brands are accustomed to engaging with it. It is performance driven. We have very clear input A, get B, all of that. This is a play that is different. How do you kind of reconcile what you know the platform to be and how you're able to measure it versus full? F- I'm all about DSP. I'm right with Summer on Full Funnel. It's the way to go. It's a mindset shift for brands in these conversations. So how do you kind of reconcile that shift? It's tough. And obviously, every situation is so unique between the brand and the category, competitive set, their distribution outside of Amazon has to be at play here. I just think that the new mindset is yes. And I think over time, in the next three years, you are going to see a disruption of cost per click and cost per million and impression per million and CPMs and all the other acronyms that are dealing in great media, brands are going to be able to buy space that they have never been able to afford before. And that's the disruption. That's the change. That's the exciting part. And yes, you have to look full funnel. I admit it. I hate to admit it, but absolutely. Because if you don't keep that brand awareness and that top level, all of a sudden the other parts of the funnel are going to decay. 
And we've seen that. So the days of return on ad spend and clearly just running a business, I put a dollar in, I better get more than a dollar back. I believe that those days are waning and that brands and CFOs, because I have a joke that CFOs run the country and run everything, and they should. I'm pro CFO, but they will have to change their mindset because these Back in the day, when you put a billboard up and 5 million people drove by it on I-5 or I-80 or I-95, they saw that trickle back. Now, I think the measurement's going to get better, and there's a lot of smart people working on that. I feel like I never answer a question. Gosh. I feel as though you did. Ken, I don't know if you have a different perspective. Feel free to be controversial here in your answer. No, I, (laughs) I don't think I'll be controversial. I was just thinking about this too, this new exciting frontier I think where we're at, like Scott was saying, like you're about to be able to get ad placements that you never were able to get before. And right now you're going to be able to get them at the cheapest rate that you are. It's only going to go up like we've seen with Amazon for the last decade. And so I just think that just reinforces some of the old cliches of fortune favors the bold. It will reward you for pushing your boundaries, maybe pushing what you're comfortable with, whatever that may look like. And just speaking anecdotally to some of the advertising folks on the Acadia side here internally, They've heard kind of rumblings of Amazon really wanting to get this flywheel moving quickly for the brands that they're working with. So there might be for certain brands, rewards for investing certain amounts and those sorts of things into this new media play, because there's a lot riding on this internally at Amazon as well. So the last thing I would say about this, I think it's probably never more important to know your true demographic, who buys your product, what is that data telling you? So investing in AMC, any sort of data or analytics into your sales because now you're going to be able to target more and more folks in more and more ways that you never were able to. So understanding your demographics and the importance of that has never been higher. So I would just say you don't have to be a huge, large national brand now, which I think is a huge takeaway. You can get experimental as a small mid-sized brand of those fighter brands. You just have to maybe have a little bit of courage to live in that top of the funnel for a little bit. I'm just thinking about this. Okay. If I'm a brand, whether a mid-sized, large brand, I don't care. The biggest challenge every brand, whether you have all the money in the world or not enough money in the world, is real estate. And listener, I'm holding up my cell phone, which they should change the name of because it's no longer their cell phone. What we all have is a real estate problem. What Amazon has is a real estate problem. It's Manhattan. It's tight. If you guys will walk with me down a path, close your eyes and imagine 1952 in Las Vegas, Nevada where there's just this tiny little thing, but all we have is space, unlimited acre after acre, thousands and thousands. Look at Phoenix, look at LA. All you have is space. That's what's going to happen with Amazon. And that's what's happening with Amazon Sports and with Prime Video. And that's what's happening as a brand. You know what? I want to go buy some real estate. I can get it at a pretty good price today, but I'm telling you in three years, five years, You're going to pay a fortune. You're going to be bummed because you're like, I wish I would have got in on that earlier. And that is my biggest message. This is a real estate play and it's smart. So take a portion of your budget, whether you're small, big or huge, you make sure you test this stuff on sponsored and connected TV and all this new real estate. That is the best way I have of illustrating what is happening because this is a simple supply demand real estate and Amazon's smart and they went, There's a lot of real estate we can go buy. And we're going to have inventory for days. Sorry, I had to get that off. It sounds like Summer has brought you over to her side as well for full funnel. Don't say that, Julie. I'm just saying. That's what I'm hearing. What I heard there was invest in the full funnel in any way you can. It's killing me. Well, you know, the good news is we can't get off the sponsored product. We can't get away from it. People love it. Well, and that's where the beauty of AMC comes in when you start to see that whole path to purchase. So Sorry if I've taken us off the script, I'm a wild child. You knew this having me on. <laughs> I started my career in education. It was Montessori education, which is all about off script and going in all directions. So I've been preparing for this for years, Scott. I'm all good. <laughs> that's hysterical. I appreciate you both coming on to talk sports and Amazon. And it's clear you know, Amazon's play and investment into sports, it's not going to slow down. And what you both have mapped out is that it presents great opportunity for brands to increase their awareness, be an early adopter, get in now while the inventory is more affordable, because that's only going to change from here. So 
Thank you both. I hope to have you both on the podcast again in the near future. And another takeaway from this is careful when you're sharing your screen. Just be careful when you screen share during calls. <laughs> My biggest thing is Ken a Georgia fan or a Kentucky fan? I'm confused now. Uh, I'm in enemy territory here. So anyone okay. listening, I believe blue Kentucky Wildcats, but I live in Athens, Georgia. So I live where the University of Georgia is. So Ooh. I can't escape it. I wear my blue to the grocery store wherever I can. I get those looks, but yeah, enemy territory. That's the also thing with live sports, Julie, as you're trying to wrap this up, which is hard to do with me on the phone here, <laughs> is the rabidness of this fandom is an opportunity for brands, manufacturers, anybody who sells on the thing. You can't buy a loyalty like a sports fan. It's remarkable what a Kentucky fan will live through just to leave Kentucky. Oh, and Ken has lived through it the past two March Madnesses. We've oh, traded. It, it goes beyond <laughs> that. We could do a whole other <laughs> podcast of my pain and suffering in the sports world. But that's exactly right. Like wherever my team plays, wherever Scott's team and Julie's team, wherever those teams play, you are immediately loyal to the platform that it's being shown on. And then the opportunities present itself. And again, with sports, you're locked in for hours. You're locked in. You're in the room. You're listening to those ads and you're seeing those ads. It's a family affair. Like I Remember, said, you know, the there's whole- only two things that bring people together, sports and tragedy. That's it. That's the list. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that, the minute that Amazon does a contract to air all Xavier college basketball games, I'm there. I will be there. (laughs) I won't be surprised. All right. Thank you both. Thanks. Thank you. you.